Thank you for joining us for part two of our John chapter five Bible study, picking up on verse 29. Verse 29, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So what's going to come forth or come to light uh, is our deepest sin nature. And so, and shall come forth that they have done good, the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Uh, the commentary puts it this way, the secrets of every heart shall be revealed. So the secrets, the secrets of every heart. So if we shine the light now on this, we're looking at a matter that God will absolutely look at later. When God looks at it, there is no more time for us to act. The wicked in this world are hoping that there is no judgment or looking upon the evil in our hearts. The scripture shows us the truth. It will happen and we must be prepared. And so this verse is showing us to believe on Jesus is the only way to have our sins forgiven. God raised Jesus from the dead to life everlasting. God raises the saved soul from dead in sin to life everlasting. There is no condemnation for the sinner saved by Christ. So if we know that uh, they shall come forth, this is, uh, if we're looking at verse 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Where are they coming forth? Out of the graves. They that have done good, and unto the resurrection of life. So what does it mean to be have done good? Unto the resurrection of life. They've been saved by Jesus. And they have done they that have done evil, those that have rejected Jesus, unto the resurrection of damnation. The lost must eagerly search their souls now, and we must encourage them to do so, as the Lord's business is one that will be fully finished in the last days, and that is now. Remember, look. In verse 28, for the hour is coming, okay? The hour is coming. Some may say the hour is at hand. We are at the point now where we are on the final precipice before the Lord calls us home. We're on the last part of this journey here on earth. And when the Lord comes back and calls his church home, then comes the judgment, amen? Uh, and we know this. We know this because uh, the Bible tells us that the, uh, uh, the, the, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and uh, the believers will be uh, follow, be called up into the air, and we must be prepared. Amen. Verse 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. Amen. While Jesus is the judge, his rule's mind for judgment comes from the Father. Jesus seeks the will of his heavenly Father in all ways. Are we doing the same? Do we understand that Jesus is made judge by God and that Jesus follows the will of God? This is a principle that helps us understand that the meek and tender love of Jesus to the lost sinner in his earthly ministry will give way to righteous judgment on the day we all face him face to face. As we seek the will of God, we must pray we are living as he'd have us to live and judging as he'd have us to judge. Let's move on here. Uh, John uh, 5, 31, we're going to read all the way down to 36. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, I uh, bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. Amen. So the Jews had asked of John the Baptist and didn't believe him after a season. How often are we sent astray after a moment on fire for God? Worshiping God is not a flash of emotion, but a steadfast devotion, discipline that supersedes emotion. Will our sinful lives not find us out? Miserable is the saved sinner. What if you only went to work or school when you felt like it? What if you only obeyed the law when you were happy? Why be casual about something as important as our faith? So what we have here is when John the Baptist, he was baptizing and, uh, they believed on John for a season. They saw this miraculous uh, 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 occurrence, this person, this forerunner of Christ coming out, telling people uh, to be baptized, that they're sinners, and they needed to be cleansed of their sin. And Jesus comes 
and is, at, is baptized by John. That's when God uh, descends like a dove from the heaven and says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And we see that people believe for a season and then they faded away. And this is constant in the Lord's ministry where people will believe, you know, during the feeding of the 5,000, they believed and they followed him. And then Jesus said, don't live for, for the meat of this life, but live for the spiritual meat, for the, the bread of life, which I am. And, and everybody basically took off because they wanted the, uh, for lack of a better word, physical things or material things or worldly things. How much are we like this? When we live for the worldly things, when we get excited about the worldly things, and when the things of God, just we push it aside, we don't believe on it. Just for a season, we might get fired up and then we go a different way. It's so sad. You know, Jesus' ministry uh, bears witness to the will and the work of the Father. God in the flesh shows us what God in the Spirit expects out of his people to accept him as Savior, to repent, and to follow his commands, such as to pray and to love each other, to be sober-minded, to be separate from the world, and so forth. There's nothing new under the sun. The Bible teaches us that. And as many churches and Christians go astray and live for themselves now, so did those then. What does it mean? It means that they never really believed. For if they had believed, they wouldn't have left the ways of God for the ways of the world. If we truly understand who God is, and we truly understand that he is the best, and he is sovereign, he is preeminent, he is all things, why on earth would we settle for anything else? See, it really puts into question our beliefs. You know, if you have someone that that they say they're saved and they say that they believe in God, they, they've made Jesus their Lord, and then they're just out living like the world, maybe they're backslid. And our Bible teaches us eternal security, once saved, always saved. Uh, yet maybe they're not saved. And I'm not trying to talk anybody out of their salvation, but if you look like the world, if you smell like the world, if you're living like the world and you don't feel conviction, you don't feel like you need to change, you need to check yourself. Because here the Bible tells us that we need to be like Christ. And we need to live like Christ. We need to understand uh, the greater witness than that of John the Baptist, the works that which the Father had given Jesus to finish, the same works he bears witness. The Father has sent me. So Jesus bear, bore witness that he was sent of God, right? In this very scripture, what do we see? We see Jesus miraculously he heal someone that was infirm for a week, a month, a year. No, 38 years, okay? 38 years, nobody could figure out how to heal this man. 38 years, he couldn't get healed. A lot of people, I think, at that point would have written this man off. And here comes God in the flesh and heals him with seven words instantly. The Bible says immediately, right? He's healed. And now what do we see? We see people doubting and wanting to kill him and all these things. And yet he's saying, look, I am bearing witness of my father, of God, right? and people are still not believing, amen? We need to believe, and we need to be steadfast in our belief, and we need to check our emotions and our fleshly desires and our sinful nature. We need to check that to be sure that that is not what is driving us towards the lusts of the flesh, things, the pride of life, the, the vain things, vanity, the foolish things. You know, we have to be very careful because there are many people with many letters behind their name and prestige and all these things that are completely afar off from God, that are completely ignorant of the things of God, that there's some that were knowledgeable of God, that grew up in Christian households, that grew up in the church and go afar off. And for what? For what? For temporal pleasure? God forbid if that's why you're doing it. For pride? Humble yourself. It's so sad. Moving on to verse 37 and 38, verses 37 and 38 here. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Wow. So here Jesus explains to the Jews a very offensive truth. They had never heard God's voice or seen him in any way. They were literally looking at God in the flesh at that moment, and they couldn't hear him. What does that mean? Like I said, if you are living like the world, if you're more concerned with enacting judgment on someone when they've been miraculously healed than asking who healed them, you're not saved. That's what he's saying. He's saying you're not saved. You may have a high religious order. You may have a very fancy robe. You may have great seats at the theater. Everyone in the market may greet you. You may have prestige. You may have riches. You may have education. But what you don't have, you don't have God. You don't have the true God. You don't have the living God. And the living God is speaking to you face to face, telling you that. And it says here, verse 38, and ye not 
and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him, ye believe not. So you keep asking maybe in your mind, well, why didn't they have God? They were speaking to God. They were, they were religious. They were of power. They were of status. Why would they not have God? Because they believe not. Verse 38, they believe not. It means though that they thought they knew who God was, what God was about. Remember, this was the time of the feast. They were at the feast. They were celebrating. They had no idea. They were wrong and thus so far off from God, they couldn't recognize him right in front of their eyes. Literally, that is kind of the humor of God. He's got himself in front of these people saying, you don't believe. And they're looking at him saying, we don't believe. We want to kill you. Jesus is shown preaching this to them while they're stuck in unbelief as a picture of how deeply lost man is in their own deception. The Jews were looking right at God and didn't know he was God and he wouldn't receive him as God for his ways were not in line with their sinful desires. Are you absolutely sure you'd recognize God if he walked through your door? Think about that. Is your God the God of your desires or the God of truth, the God of righteousness, the God of perfect sovereignty, the God of Jesus, is that your God? Because that God is calling you to repentance. That God is calling you to walk in faith. That God is calling you to be separate apart. That God is a God that is disgusted by your desire for all the luxurious things and all the world riches and all the vanity and all the glory. You know who gets the glory? God gets the glory. If God made us to glorify him and all you do is glorify yourself or work to have glory come to you, what good are you to God? And then he sends his son to die on the cross for you to save you from hell. And what do you do? You reject his son. Well, now what are you to God? Nothing. You're nothing to him. And we never, ever want to be on the losing side of that battle. Amen. We want to accept God. He has great mercy. If you look at the character of God throughout the scriptures and, and very much so in all of the, uh, the works that Jesus does here in his earthly ministry, it shows the mercy of God. But when you see the mercy, where is the mercy applied? It's often applied to the humble, repentant sinner. It's applied to those that are the tax collector, the harlot, uh, the fisherman, the the uh, the everyday down and out person, right? That is where you're seeing God's love and his mercy because they're humble enough to accept him. And many times they're from the upper prestigious class. They are the ones to stick up their nose and say, no, thank you. And, and that's who the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry ends up reprimanding the most, not the sinner. It's those that are, that are supposedly uh, the religious folks, the ones that have all the answers. Those are the ones that end up getting reprimanded. Verse 39 Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Wow. So now Jesus tells them not only do they not know him, have they not heard him, they can't, they won't accept him. Now he tells them to get back in their Bibles, which had to be highly offensive because they had claimed that they would be experts in the Bible. Uh, at, that, at that time, from my understanding, they were uh, basically interpreters of the Bible and of the law, kind of like a lawyer would be to explain uh, the laws on the books, like literally the laws in the courts and the land and so forth. That's how they viewed their roles. Uh, and then also as intermediaries between uh, the people and God. Uh, verse 39, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. You know, the Bible tells us many will come to the Lord uh, and say, I've cast out devils in your name. I've, I've fed people. I've I've clothed people. I donated to causes and all these things. And, you know, I shared a post on Facebook and this and that. And the Lord will say, what? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. That means sin, you worker of sin, for I never knew you, right? Do you know the Lord? Do you have a close relationship with the Lord? You should. Uh, Jesus tells them to search the scriptures more diligently. They had misread, misunderstood the scriptures to glorify themselves and not God. What church, what organization, what group of people are misreading, misunderstanding, misinterpreting the scriptures to glorify themselves and not God. Friend, if you're part of a congregation where things are very easy on you and it's a social gathering and it's easy breezy and there is no preaching on sin and there's no call to salvation and your works apparently can save you or your money can save you, get out now, search the scriptures, read the Bible, spend time in the New Testament, ask the preacher why they're not preaching this. Ask them to show you what the heck is going on. They may tell you some crazy doctrine. I have no idea. In fact, you could send me a message. I'd love to leave a comment. I'd love to know. 
uh, what they would say, but search the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life. So many of uh, these uh, denominations that have this easy breezy uh, prosperity gospel or social gospel or any other kind of gospel, they think they're going to heaven because of whatever it is, right? Their, their character, their, their pedigree, their status, their works, but they are not. They're not because the, those that go to heaven, they do what? Here, verse 39, the scriptures, they are they which testify of me. So Jesus is saying the scriptures testify of him. It's a really interesting verse. How many lost people think they're going to heaven because their church says so, minister said so, culture says so? What does Jesus tell us to do here? Search the scriptures. Then Jesus gives us a clue as to who is going to heaven. They are which they are they which testify of me. To have eternal life in the scriptures points exclusively to Jesus, not just for us now with the benefits of verses in the New Testament like this one, Romans 10, verse 9 through 10. This is the founding verse of our church, by the way. Romans 10, 9 through 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But in the Old Testament, that was the point I'm making here. It's not just simple, clear scripture like this that says, confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart, God hath raised him from the dead, right? So that's obviously pretty explanatory. It says, thou shalt be saved. Like You will be saved if you do this. Okay, that's pretty much plain spoken English. Again, anyone that's preaching something different than this, ask them, what's up with Romans 9, 10, 9 through 10? Ask them what's, what's going on with that. Uh, show them this in the King James, see what they say. Um, but in the Old Testament as well, Jesus pointed to throughout the entire book, scholars say there's over 400 verses, I believe it's probably more than that, can be linked to Jesus in the Bible. Many preachers have helped illustrate the fact that all of the Old Testament points to Jesus as Lord. But a few of the verses that directly point to Jesus that that the Lord was uh, compelling these uh, these Jews to go look back in their Bible would be Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So here in the book of Isaiah, they're being told there's going to be someone born, and a son is going to be there, and they're going to have power, and they're going to be God, right? Uh, Micah 5.2 gives the exact location for the birth of the Messiah. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Zechariah 9.9 9 shows uh, the Messiah riding into Jerusalem on a young donkey, which is fulfilled in John 12, 14 through 15. Re Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the full of an ass. So it's telling exactly who Jesus is and how he'll appear to them. Isaiah 53, describing who Jesus is and what he has to go through. If you read Isaiah 53, a beautiful a chapter in the scriptures, describes all that Jesus had to go through to, to save us from our sins. So we must search the scriptures to know right from wrong and what the way is to salvation and the way to living here on earth for an eternity to come not hell as many are bound. Amen. He tells us to search the scriptures. He was telling them then to search the scriptures. He's telling us now to search the scriptures. If you ever want to find out, is a preacher right? Is a church right? So on and so forth. Compare it vehemently to the scriptures uh, uh, with, with all ve uh, ze uh, goodness, zeal and vigor. That was what I was trying to get out. Zeal and vigor. Uh, excitement and effort compare the preaching of God's word to the scriptures. And if it lines up, then that's a good church and that's a good uh, pastor. And that's a good Bible believing uh, church that is right with God. And if it doesn't line up, then get as far away as you can, because truly uh, the Bible is called uh, the living word. The Bible is called the truth. Uh, in the Bible, we get to know God. In the Bible, it tells us about prophecy. In the Bible, it teaches us how to live. The Bible is our main source for all of all of uh, the character of God and the truth of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here doing this Bible study. Verse 40, 
in John 5, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Jesus predicts or showcases, if you will, the fact that the Jews won't turn to him. Verse 41, I received not honor from men. Jesus walked this earth not for honor from men, the world, but to save man from what man worshiped, the world. Do we seek honor from men? I bet we often do. We want honor from men in work or at school. We want to be promoted. We want to be popular in life. We want awards and approval. Do we not? We want honor from men. Think about all those that ever talked about wanting some kind of honor. You know, at school, if you were, when I played football, I wanted to be all county. And then if I was all county, I wanted to be all state, right? Uh, you know, you want a letter, be on the varsity, you know, you want to have a, be an academic All-American or whatever it is. You want to be valedictorian. You strive for these things, right? And then you get on to uh, work and you want to be, uh, you want honor. You want to have that title. I think people's professional titles are hysterical. Everybody's a director of something, right? Uh, operator, director. I mean, how many different ways can they say these things? But everybody wants honor from men. Yet Jesus tells us he seeks not honor from men. Why? Because he came to save us. And if he sought honor from men, he wouldn't have been able to do the will of the Father. Do you understand that? If you seek honor from men, you will not be able to do the will of the Father. Very, very powerful principle there. Do not seek honor from men, seek honor from God. And if you live and work to honor God, the rest will take care of itself. Amen. John 5, uh, verse 42. But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. Okay, so does Jesus know us? Yes, but I know you. Doesn't mean like he knows their name or a little bit about them. He's God. He knows everything about them. In the Bible, you'll often read, it'll say that uh, the Lord Jesus perceived that they were upset or that they didn't believe or whatever. What that means is that he knew. He knows everything about us. You know, the Bible says God knows how many hairs we have on our head, uh, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made, that there is uh, every bit of us is known to God, our deepest emotions. Uh, he he greets uh, somebody in the Bible, Jesus does, saying, oh, here is so-and-so, uh, you know, a person without guile, without any kind of wrong in his heart. And he's thinking, how do you know me? And he says, oh, well, uh, I, I heard you under the tree. And that was when this man was praying by himself under a tree. And he was like, you must be God because no one else heard me, but it was God. So Jesus is God and he knows us. He knows our deepest fears, our deepest desires. He knows everything about us. So that's the joke of the joke of the joke of the lost person thinking they can live in sin secretly. There is no secrets with God and the saved person faces the same fate. When we live in sin and don't repent, we're kindling God's wrath even more because not only are we not sinning, but now we don't even have the faith to believe and know that he knows us. But verse 42, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. Jesus knew them. He knows us. We can't fool him. The Jews tried it and it didn't work. While man is easily fooled, the Lord is never fooled. We must not kid ourselves. God knows our ways and he's not tricked by an act or persona. And here the Lord is saying, they have not the love of God in them. And again, if they had the love of God in them, they'd be more excited that the infirm man, the one with the great infirmity was, was healed after 38 years. They'd be more excited and glorifying God than they were worried about killing Jesus because it was the Sabbath day. Alrighty, verse uh, 43, I come in my father's name and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Although Jesus came in the name of the living God, they received him not. Though we preach the living God with proof in the Bible, such as prophecy, Holy Spirit conviction, uh, the un unbelievable wisdom in the Bible, and so on, people still don't believe. They won't believe. Why? Because of sin, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and unwillingness to turn to the things of God because we don't want our toes stepped on. We don't want to change. Think about how scary change is. People don't want to change. Look, I'm a preacher and I don't love change. Again, I was someone, again, if you listen to the first part of the study, that was pretty open to taking risks when I was young as a business person and so forth. And change scares me, you know. Uh, recently had somewhat of a change of uh, jobs, careers uh, for my vocation part. And uh, yeah, it's scary. You know, it's scary. Change is scary. We don't want to change. And we live in a culture that tells us we should get what we want. And so many people, they'll say, I'm rooted in, in how I am and I'm not going to change, and I like my sin, I like the lust of the flesh, I'm fine right here in the world, I'm not going to change. And when things get bad, which God allows ha to happen to get closer to him and to rely on him, I'll just take a medicine, you know, I'll take some medicine and numb myself. 
well, this is the most silly thing I've ever heard in my life. And I, I'm not against people taking medicine, but if you're taking an antidepressant and you're depressed, God's allowed you to become depressed so that you'll turn to him. And instead you just numb yourself to that. Now the devil's laughing all the way to the bank because he can just keep you numb and indifferent rather than you getting the root of the problem fixed. And again, I'm not against therapy. I'm not against medication, but I am against those that don't want to seek the father's will because they are afraid to change or because they love their sin too much. God says, I'll give you what you need. Who's willing to accept that? A very few. Why does this verse say these religious leaders will accept, won't accept it? People that come in their own name, they would accept. So if you represent the things of God, that's unacceptable to the world now as it was then. But if you come in your own name, like with pride and vanity, you're very acceptable to the world. You think about that. You know, in this world, people that are boastful, people that are, that are bragging, people that are brash, people... Uh, that are prideful. These these folks get a lot of attention from the world, admiration from the world, uh, confidence in in uh, in ego. In the sense, you know, all of these things are are valued by the world and loved, and it's entertainment. And these people are lifted up. And, and God hates a proud heart and hates a proud look and hates people like this uh, acting like this. I should say, He loves people, uh, but He hates them acting like this. He, he hates their sin. Yet the world lifts them up. You know, you see the perversion in this. That the devil has brought about in this wicked culture a me generation, one that hates the things of God. Why? Because the things of God are not friendly to the me generation, but to the humble, repentant, lowly sinner. When do you see the humble, repentant, lowly sinner highlighted on TV and lifted up and all these things? You don't because they are not of the world. How great a day it is when we realize our form and turn to God in all ways. He will exalt us in due time in a great and wonderful irony to the ways of the world. You know, the Bible says that first Peter five, six, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Look, when I say we're serving a God of all power, right? And has a plan for us. Even he has a plan to exalt us in due time. If we're humble under the mighty hand of God. I remember uh, at, at Glory Bound where I used to uh, uh, attend church and I was a, uh, I guess, youth preacher, quote unquote. I was the oldest youth preacher, but I was a youth preacher, quote unquote. And uh, I was also a deacon there. And uh, we had the deacon uh, ordination ceremony and you have to go through the traits of the deacon. And I remember uh, Pastor Mike there going through uh, just the different things that uh, I was involved in in the church. And uh, it was very, it was very uh, sweet, you know, the things he said and you know, the church was there and it was a little embarrassing, but it was very nice. And uh, I thought of this verse, you know, I try to be humble and live humble. And uh, God had, had given me that little bit of exaltation in that time. And I think that uh, when we get to heaven, it might be a little bit like that for the lowly servants of God that had been beat up uh, here on earth. Uh, I love that song, Palms of Victory. And uh, it's talking about the man beaten up and beaten down and He's, uh, he's almost done with his journey, and there'll be palms of victory. Amen. And we'll be praising Jesus, of course, and we'll be praising the Lord uh, Jesus and, and our God for the rest of eternity. And our God's a God of love, and he, he takes care of his children, and he exalts us in due time. Amen. J John 5, verse 44, how can ye believe which honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? So this is the verse when I read, read John 5 recently that made me want to do a Bible study because I said, dang, this is very, very deep. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? All right, let's see how we can dig into this one. Pride, honor, and vainglory is why they wouldn't believe on Jesus. So pride, honor, and vainglory is why they wouldn't believe on Jesus. What does this mean? They had pride in their hearts. They were working to seek honor from man. What did Jesus look like? The Bible says he was of lowly report. Where was he from? A know-nothing town called Nazareth. So you understand this, that Jesus didn't look like some mighty Roman warrior or something or some giant like in the times of Goliath. He didn't look like a, anything special like a king you know, would, would look. But that was all intentional. You understand? You understand how God did this? He sent himself into the world as basically a nobody from a know-nothing town called Nazareth. What did he have of worldly value? Nothing. He was a carpenter. He was Joseph's son. He didn't have anything. 
You know, the Bible says, uh, you know, when someone, a young man was saying he'd follow Jesus anywhere, he said, look, I don't have anywhere to lay, lay my head at night. Even the foxes have holes. You know, the birds have nests. I don't even have a bed. And, and here we are. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, there was no room in the inn when he was born. This is our Savior. And so is this the Savior God that would be worshipped today by the world? Absolutely not. He would, if he didn't look a certain way. If you don't believe people judge in this world on how you look, you're crazy. Um, there's a lot of judgment going on on how people look and their uh, when I used to teach public speaking, there was a whole chapter in this textbook about artifacts, this idea of like what, you know, if you have a tattoo or a piercing, or your hair is not done, if you're wearing your pajamas, whatever it is, people will judge you on that instantly. They're going to judge you. And, and I'm not saying that Jesus looked like that, but he, the Bible says he was of lowly report. So he looked like, uh, I would think, an either average person or uh, a poor person. He didn't look like anything special, probably looked uh, you know, just like somebody getting by, you know, everyday person at the most. And the Jews were looking for someone to follow that would give them honor, someone with great looks and appearance. Pomp is the word the commentators use. They were looking to worship somebody that would give them honor. And in their own deceitful, vain, and prideful ways. So they Again, uh, if you, it's an election year. I won't go too deep in this, but, you know, I believe God will hand us over. You know, if we're going to vote for a sinful leader, we're going to vote for someone that believes in things that are against God. I think at times God will say, here you go, and it'll be awful, and we'll he'll hand us over to it. And the Jews, they wanted a leader uh, like Pilate. They wanted a politician. They didn't want the true God because the true God was about the inside, the heart, the character of the person not some vain temporal thing like looks. Uh, Barnes uh, mentions the great reason why multitudes do not believe in their attachment to human honors or their pride and vanity and ambition. These are so strong that while they continue, they cannot and will not believe. They might, however, renounce these things and then the obstacles being removed, they would believe. So Barnes here notes that the great reason why multitudes do not believe in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is their attachment to human honors or their pride and vanity and ambition. All of these things we must check at the door when we live for Christ. And it's scary because the Bible says count the cost. You know, it's a great cost. We live for the Lord. Things change a lot. Uh, and they might, uh, however, renounce these things, Barnes says, and then the obstacles being removed, they would believe. So if we remove uh, human honors, pride, and vanity and ambition, then we might believe. 1 Corinthians 1, 28 through 29, and base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So we're told here that the Lord uses the base things of the world Things which are despised hath God chosen, and yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. It's this idea that God will use uh, little things. God will use the David versus the Goliath, or God will use uh, Esther. Uh, God will use uh, the little things, uh, uh, the harlot, uh, Rahab, I was thinking of. Uh, all of those folks, you read about many of them in the Hebrews Hall of Fame. God will use folks that come from... Uh, far off places from place of little to no report. I mean, this scripture mentions John, John the Baptist coming uh, from the, uh, if you read about John the Baptist, he was out in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey and wearing like skins and stuff on his body. He was very different than the average person. That's who God will use. That's why if everything is right and in order in your life and everything is perfect, uh, you know, in with the world and you and you're synced up, you need to check and make sure you're right with God because uh, we are to be apart from this world. Amen. Uh, and then let's go through the last scriptures here. Uh, verse 45 through 47. Do not think that I will ac accuse you to the Father. There's one that accuse, ac accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But ye believe not his writings. How shall ye believe my words? Uh, so Moses had written of Jesus coming, the Messiah. And here Jesus tells them they don't believe. Their own go-to source for godly living. It is the ultimate highlighting of how Jesus is literally right in front of them and written about in the Old Testament, and yet they still won't believe. 
So how does this relate to us now? Are we looking for honor in our service to Christ? Are we looking to uh, for God to be somewhere special, a huge building, a large congregation in the government? Or do we understand the character of God is to be with the poor, the struggling, the down and out, and to lift them up by his Holy Spirit? God's an active God, amen. God is at work in this universe. God is a God of work, right? And God is a God that that blesses us uh, when we're used by him. How does this relate to us personally? Are we letting pride get in the way of us seeing Jesus? Do we understand how important it is to study God's word and to rightly divide? How many people are headed for hell because they trust the church to bring them into heaven and they don't even know their true need? The church is oftentimes bringing something so watered down it makes no move towards salvation to the sinner or repentance and humble living to the saint. Let's understand what Jesus is speaking of here. We are often in this exact situation, thinking we are do something extraordinary when God is absolutely in every bit of the everyday, ordinary lives we lead. Let's thank him and praise him for that and get back to living for him deeply in all ways. Understanding that we are in the last days, we are meant for God's glory. We are to be humble and meek, and we are to serve him with our whole hearts till he returns to take us home. What a powerful passage John 5 is in reminding us of the dangers of presumption and the omnipotent power of God to know all things, see all things, be everywhere, and rightly judge all, even those that look the part of a Christian but inwardly are not. And I'll leave you with this verse, Proverbs 22, verse 4, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. So converse to the Jews at that time, And all of the other uh, folks living for the world here today, by humility and the fear of the Lord, by humility, humble. What's humble? It means no pride. Humility and the fear of the Lord. How do you fear the Lord? You reverence him. You respect him. You get in his word and you seek to know him. By humility and fear of the Lord are what? Riches, honor, and life. Isn't that what you would want anyways? Isn't that what you would seek in the worldly sense? And God says, here's who gets it. Here's who truly has it. Those that are humble and those that fear me. And those things like riches and honor and life, they're not temporal. They're not like a bag of money and a vitamin so you can live another extra three weeks. It is riches in heaven. It is honor of the Father, which is so much more profound than having man's honor. And it's life everlasting. It's life that's eternal. What is this life but a vapor, the Bible says. It's literally, what, imagine drawing out a timeline of eternity. You'd keep drawing forever, but let's say you stopped after, I don't know, a million, you know, a million miles. Okay. Well, what is our life? Our life is 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. And if you had a million miles charted out and each mile equaled, say, a year, then what's what's that? That's nothing. That's not even 1%. It's nothing. It's not even 0.01%. It, it, literally, eternity is forever. This life is so faint. And here Jesus in John 5 shows us that we must be about our Father's business and to live for him eternally uh, means to live for him now, because to, in order to have eternal life, we need to be saved. And in order to be rewarded in heaven and to have honor with the Father, we need to have humility and fear of the Lord, and we need to live for him now. And that is, I hope, what you take away from John 5. I appreciate your time and your attention to these videos, and I'll pray and we'll be done. Dear Lord, please move in the hearts of those that, that listen to this or that watch this, that spent the time to uh, get into your word, Lord. Please help help them explore your word more, Lord, and help them uh, use all of this and all their future Bible studies as well to guide them closer to you, to live for you, and to witness to others, to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person they meet, and to be a living example, not found like the Jews to be hypocrites, not found to be fake, not found to be vain or after the lusts and flashes of emotion, but after you, the true everlasting God, the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God, 
and to honor you in all ways by loving your son, Jesus, by praying in Jesus' name, and by being there uh, just with you at all times and not, not going afar off, not being a backslider, not being part of the modern church or part of the world, but being sold out to you and on that narrow path, Lord. That's my prayer today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.